Hi, this is Dr. Arshad. I'm one of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellows at Duke. The learning objectives for today's talk are the basic pathogenesis of GBS, the epidemiology of a neonatal disease, clinical manifestations of the different forms of neonatal disease, strategies for treatment and prevention. The outline of today's talk are to discuss the pathogenesis of GBS, to talk about the epidemiology of disease and how it has been changed in recent years, to discuss the different clinical manifestations, to talk about treatment in neonates and also the prophylaxis that can be used in mothers, and to look at the guidelines for prevention of early onset GBS. So group B streptococci are facultative gram-positive cocci that are grown easily. They appear on sheep blood agar at 3 to 4 millimeter gravite colonies with a narrow zone of beta hemolysis. The group B specific cell wall carbohydrate antigen is common to all strains, whereas a cell wall carbohydrate antigen allows their classification into serotypes 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Group B streptococci have pillus like structures that are composed of protein antigens. The alpha C surface protein mediates translocation of GBS across epithelial barriers, and GBS can also use a paracellular route to cross epithelial cells by transiently opening cell junctions. The beta hemolysin of GBS forms pores that cause cellular damage by lysing epithelial and endothelial cells and compromising their barrier function. After invasion, capsular polysaccharides is a major virulence factor for GBS, allowing the organism to evade opsonization. Type 3 strains have a tropism for the meninges and the capacity of type 3 strains to elaborate high levels of capsular polysaccharide during growth may enhance their virulence. As you will see later, this is an important strain in GBS infection in the infants. Depending on the method of testing, 15 to 40 percent of mothers can carry GBS in the third trimester. The incidence of early onset GBS that is within the first six days of life has declined by 70% compared with pre-prevention era baseline rate in 1993 when the ACOG guidelines were published recommending prenatal screening of mothers. In 2005, the incidence of early onset GBS was 0.31 cases per 1,000 live births. The incidence of late onset infection that is seven to 89 days of, of age has changed little during 1996 to 2005, averaging at about 0.35 per 1,000 live births. CDC first issued guidelines on the use of intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis for prevention of GBS disease in 1996. Those guidelines were revised in 2002 when it was recommended that all women undergo vaginal rectal screening for GBS colonization at 35 to 37 weeks gestation to identify which woman should receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. Implementation of 2002 guidelines has been quite good. Presenting signs such as lethargy, apnea, or bradycardia, and poor feeding are not distinguishable from those in neonates with other bacterial infections. Respiratory distress is usually prominent with chest x-ray suggestive of pneumonia or respiratory distress syndrome. Features that are, such as irritability and hyperthermia are noted more often in term than preterm infants, but can be present in both. This is a very important slide. Early onset GBS is commonly associated with maternal complications. The initial presenting signs are not any different from neonatal sepsis and can include lethargy, apnea, etc. as discussed earlier. The clinical syndromes that are most commonly associated with early onset GBS include bacteremia without focus, pneumonia, and meningitis. The mortality rate is higher than in other forms of GBS and outcome especially worse in premature infants and in those who present with septic shock. Late onset infection can occur anywhere from one week to three months of life. The median age is 27 days. Affected infants are usually asymptomatic early on in life, but then present with fever, lethargy, and poor feeding. Again, bacteremia is the most common, but patients can also have meningitis, pneumonia, osteomyelitis, cellulitis, or adenitis. Osteomyelitis is the most common in the proximal humerus. The mean age of diagnosis for arthritis is 20 days, and the knee and hip joints are most commonly involved. Late, late onset GBS infection occurs in infants more than three months. Commonly, these are premature infants. Among the risk factors are prolonged hospital course, 
likely related to prematurity, immature immune system, and the persistent mucosal colonization. Initial therapy for suspected GBS infection is ampicillin plus aminoglycosides. This regimen provides broad coverage for neonatal pathogens, and the combination is synergistic in vitro and in vivo for killing GBS. When GBS has been confirmed as a causative pathogen, clinical response has been observed, and sterility of the bloodstream and CSF has been documented. At 24 to 48 hours, treatment can be completed with penicillin G alone. Several studies have confirmed the uniform susceptibility of GBS to penicillin. The suggested dosages and expected duration of therapy are summarized in this table. These dosages have proved safe and effective even in small premature infants. The rationale for use of the high dose it recommended is that the minimal inhibitory concentration or MIC of penicillin for GBS ranges from 0.01 to 0.6 micrograms per ml and is directly affected by the inoculum and that the inoculum and the sites of infection can be high. Antibiotic levels achieved in blood or CSF with the suggested doses will exceed the MIC even when infection is associated with a high inoculum of a strain with an MIC at the upper range of susceptibility. Women with GBS isolated from the urine at any time during the current pregnancy or who have had a previous infant with an invasive GBS disease should receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis and do not need third trimester screening for GBS colonization. All other pregnant women should be screened at 35 to 37 week gestation for vaginal and rectal GBS colonization. At the time of labor or rupture of membranes, intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis should be given to all pregnant women who tested positive for GBS colonization except in the instance of cesarean delivery performed before onset of labor on a woman with intact amniotic membranes. For circumstances in which screening results are not available at the time of labor and delivery, intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis should be given to women who are less than 37 weeks and zero days gestation, have a duration of membrane of rupture more than 18 hours, or who have a temperature of more than 100.4 degree Fahrenheit. Women expected to undergo cesarean delivery should undergo routine vaginal and rectal screening for GBS at 35 to 37 week gestation because onset of labor or rupture of membranes can occur before the planned cesarean delivery and under those circumstances, GBS colonized women should receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. Women admitted with signs and symptoms of labor or with rupture of membrane at less than 37 weeks and zero days gestation should be screened for GBS colonization at hospital admission unless a vaginal rectal GBS screen was performed within the preceding five weeks. Women admitted with signs and symptoms of preterm labor who have unknown GBS colonization status at admission or a positive GBS screen within the preceding five weeks should receive GBS prophylaxis at hospital admission. Antibiotics given for GBS prophylaxis to a woman with preterm labor should be discontinued immediately if at any point it is determined that she is not in true labor or if the GBS culture at admission is negative, but they should get prophylaxis again when true labor starts. Women with threatened preterm delivery who have a GBS screen performed that is positive and do not deliver at that time should receive GBS prophylaxis when true labor begins. Make sure that these women are rescreened at 35 to 37 weeks again if they are found to be negative at the current time. Penicillin remains the agent of choice for intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis with ampicillin as an acceptable alternative. Penicillin allergic women who do not have a history of anaphylaxis, angioedema, respiratory distress, or urticaria following administration of a penicillin or cephalosporin should receive cefazolin. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing should be ordered for antenatal GBS cultures performed in penicillin allergic women at high risk for anaphylaxis because of a history of anaphylaxis with either penicillins or cephalosporins. To ensure proper testing, clinicians must inform laboratories of the need for antimicrobial susceptibility testing in such cases. Penicillin allergic women at high risk for anaphylaxis should receive clindamycin if their GBS isolate is susceptible to clindamycin and erythromycin as determined by antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Any newborn with signs of sepsis should receive a full diagnostic evaluation and receive antibiotic therapy pending the results of the evaluation. The evaluation should include a blood culture, a CBC, including the white blood cell differential and platelet count, a chest radiograph if any abnormal respiratory signs are present, and a lumbar puncture if the newborn is stable enough to tolerate the procedure and sepsis is suspected. Therapy for the infant should include antimicrobial agents 
active against GBS, including intravenous ampicillin, as well as other organisms that might cause neonatal sepsis such as E. coli. Well-appearing newborns whose mothers had suspected chorioamnionitis should undergo a limited evaluation and receive antibiotic therapy pending culture results. The evaluation should include a blood culture and a CBC, including white blood cell differential and platelet count. No chest radiograph or lumbar puncture is needed. Consultation with obstetric providers to assess whether chorioamnionitis was suspected is important to determine neonatal management. Well-appearing infants of any gestational age whose mothers received adequate intrapartum GBS prophylaxis, that is, more than four hours of penicillin, ampicillin, or cefazolin before delivery, and should be observed for more than 48 hours and no routine diagnostic testing is recommended. For well-appearing infants born to mothers who had an indication for GBS prophylaxis but received no or inadequate prophylaxis, if the infant is well-appearing and more than 37 weeks and zero days gestational age, and the duration of membrane of rupture before delivery was less than 18 hours, then the infant should be observed for more than 48 hours and no routine diagnostic testing is recommended. If the infant is well-appearing and either less than 37 weeks and zero days, gestational age, or the duration of membrane of rupture before delivery was more than 18 hours, then the infant should undergo a limited evaluation and observation for more than 48 hours. So in summary, Group B streptococcus are gram-positive cocci that are grown on sheep blood agar. The incidence of early-onset GBS disease has been reduced significantly after implementation of preventive strategies which include universal screening of mothers who are 35 to 37 weeks pregnant. However, the incidence of late-onset GBS remains the same. Sepsis and meningitis are more common in early-onset disease, and focal disease and or bacteremia are more often seen in late-onset disease. Beta-lactams such as penicillin and ampicillin are the first-line therapy.